Welcome to the fifth and last learning module of Future Us, a roadmap to elder abuse prevention. My name is Benedict Schupflin. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. On March 24, 2022, CNPA released Future Us, a roadmap to elder abuse prevention. You can access it at futureus.cnpa.ca. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Krista James, National Director of the Canadian Centre for Elder Law, who will highlight legal priorities and opportunities for addressing elder abuse. It is now my pleasure to welcome Krista James. Take it away, Krista. So thanks, Benedict. What I want to do today is talk about elder abuse and neglect, look at both the law and best practice. And what I'm going to do today is uh, provide an overview of some of the elements of our practical guide to elder abuse and neglect law in Canada, which is being published in just a few weeks. So the things that I'm going to do today is I talk about some of the basics of criminal law, provide a comparative summary of provincial and territorial laws in colonial Canada. And I want this to be a session that makes sense for everyone here. So I'm not going to go too deep into each jurisdiction, but the practical guide when it goes up is going to provide you with all the detail you need. And I'll, then I'll conclude by offering some best practices for responding to abuse and neglect of an older person. So just briefly, a little bit about the Canadian Centre for Elder Law. We are part of a nonprofit called the British Columbia Law Institute, which is based out of Vancouver. We look at law and policy issues that impact us as we age, and our work includes publishing reports and educational tools, doing research, consulting with seniors and people who work with seniors from across the country. All the work that we do, we make available on our website for free. So you can see on the slide, the URL to our website, and in your own time, you can take a look at some of the work that we're doing. Just to give you a sense of some of the topics that we're looking at, in addition to abuse and neglect of older adults, you can see on the slide, we do a lot of work in relation to healthcare decision-making rights for people living with dementia. We have a current new project funded by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada to look specifically at consent in the context of uh, participating in research for people living with dementia. We have a, another new project funded by the BC Council to Reduce Elder Abuse to look at supporting um, witnesses who have capacity issues in, a, in criminal court. So that could be older people who have experienced abuse and neglect and um, are part of a criminal case. And then we are also looking at policy reform right now in terms of healthcare assistance and their work in home, community, and long-term care. They are unregulated professionals right now in Ontario, you often call them PSWs, uh, in personal support workers. In BC, we often say care aides, but they're all over Canada doing different kinds of work. And we want to look at how we can maybe increase um, regulation or oversight of their practice to make sure that older people and also these vulnerable workers are safe in their work. So just briefly about me, because I know there wasn't an introduction to me in this session. I'm a lawyer. I think I've been a lawyer about 25 years now. I'm the national director of the Canadian Center for Elder Law. I am a settler person working from um, my offices on Musqueam land. And if you want to take a look at my work, uh, you can see my URL uh, for our website right here where I publish all my writing and also my handle on Twitter where I do a lot of talking about abuse and neglect issues and try to share resources that I can think can be um, helpful to people in their work. So now to get to the sort of tofu of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about our new practical guide to elder abuse and neglect law in Canada. We've had this resource on our website for over 10 years now, but we have some funding from the Department of Justice and the BC Association of Community Response Networks to update this guide. One of the exciting things that we're doing with this update is we're publishing this resource as a searchable, standalone, French-English bilingual website. So that instead of having to find a PDF or print a PDF or get a document, you can look at this uh, resource in real time and know that it's always current. So our release date right now for the practical guide is April 12th. 
we'll be releasing it with a webinar collaboration with the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. This slide shows you some of the key features of this website. There are modules on the law in each province and territory. There's a bit of a summary of uh, key federal legislation, including the criminal law. We introduce some lenses to apply to your work and we publish our guiding principles for best practice. Um, you can see stars on sl the slide here. Those are the parts of the guide that I'm gonna focus on in this talk. There are other elements to this guide. We have a, set, a glossary of terms. We have uh, links to all the elder abuse and neglect resources that we have published at the Canadian Center for Elder Law. And we have a section on laws that are relevant to indigenous people living on reserve land, um, to their property and their relationships. Sometimes the law is a little bit different, although in that context, you also wanna make yourself aware of the reserve uh, and band and nation policies as well as the legislation. So just to give you a, a sense of the territorial and provincial module snapshots, this slide shows you all the different parts. I'm not gonna cover them all today. So I just wanna give you a sense of them broadly. I'm gonna cover the first three pieces. So adult protection laws, laws applying to long-term care and family violence legislation, covering that today. But the law also talks about employment laws that are relevant to elder abuse and neglect response, such as taking leave for family violence. We discuss privacy law. There are sections on financial substitute decision makers and how you can respond if you're concerned about their work. We inserted this section due to sort of requests from the public to enhance the guide. There's information on what to do if you'd like to report abuse by a regulated health professional. We include some information on policy, such as criminal prosecution policy for elder abuse or related topics, policy in the province regarding income assistance access. If you're an immigrant who is an older person who's experienced sponsorship breakdown. And we also have a comprehensive section on helpful agencies in your province and territory. I just want to highlight that we have a section on our practical guide of lenses we encourage you to bring to your work. I'm not going to go into them deeply into this presentation, but I just want to flag them. I think they are really important in supporting us to have a an inclusive practice when we're thinking about elder abuse response. So the, the guide mentions and describes these five different lenses that you can bring to your work. They include trauma-informed practice, cultural safety, and humility. You'll notice I'm not saying cultural competency because I think most of us have moved away from thinking there's a possibility of becoming competent in someone else's culture through education. We provide some information on dementia, age and disability friendly practice, a lot of communication strategies you can apply to your work. We have a section on gender dynamics awareness. So to support you to bring you know, feminist analysis to your elder abuse response. And there's a section on sexual orientation and gender identity inclusion in applying that to your own work. A brief shout out to our sponsors. So the update to the practical guide was fu funded largely by the government of Canada. And we also had some supporting funding from the BC Association of Community Response Networks. So now I'd like to give you a bit of an overview of the criminal law. So the elder abuse response framework in Canada is, cannot be reducible to one single law, which you find are there's the criminal law, which applies to our practice. And that's one of the few federal laws. So laws that apply across Canada that is relevant to abuse and neglect response. And then also there are provincial and territorial laws that really dominate our practice. In the following section, I'm going to go into provincial and territorial laws. But briefly, I just want to give you a bit of a summary of elements of the criminal law. So most crimes are age neutral in Canada. That said, there are some provisions that ca could capture particular situations of abuse and neglect 
I highlight some relevant criminal code sections on this slide. Obviously, sexual assault and assault could be prosecuted under the assault and sexual assault uh, provisions of the criminal code. Uh, emotional abuse could be a form of criminal harassment or intimidation. For example, an abuser who threatens to harm a pet could be charged with uttering threats. An adult child who tries to prevent the grandparent from having access to grandchildren in order to get what they want, such as access to property or money, could be charged with extortion. I also mentioned forcible confinement because, you know, we hear many stories about older people, particularly immigrants who are kind of confined in a, in a housing situation, and that also can be a, a kind of criminal offense. There are at least 20 criminal code provisions that could be used to prosecute financial abuse of older adults, which is one of the most commonly reported forms of elder abuse. I list some of those provisions on the slide, and I'd like to highlight theft by a person holding a power of attorney, which is section 331, because that is one of the most common forms of financial elder abuse. You'll see mischief on this slide. What that means is basically reckless and willful destruction of somebody else's property. So you can see in a financial abuse context, there really are many criminal code provisions to choose from. There are many provisions of the criminal code that are available for charging in the context of neglect. It could be prosecuted as a failure to provide the necessaries of life or criminal negligence if there is a dependency relationship. You know, and, and if death results of neglect, you can see on the slide that there are a number of criminal code offenses that can be charged. So is elder abuse a crime? The answer is almost always maybe. Some acts will clearly be criminal in nature and others like, you know, humiliating a person, preventing them from seeing grandchildren could be more challenging to prosecute, but could be a criminal offense. The Advocacy Center for the Elderly has developed this helpful image that illustrates how different forms of elder abuse align with criminal code provisions. In 2011, I wrote a paper for the government of Canada that reviewed and analyzed a number of cases where elder abuse has been prosecuted. And this paper can give you a sense about how um, criminal code provisions jive or don't jive with sections of the criminal code. And elder abuse, I um, invite you to look at that paper in your leisure, and I think there'll be some information on how to find this paper in the slide notes to this presentation. Sometimes I have heard folks say that a matter is not criminal because there is a civil remedy available, meaning either there is a response available under one of the laws I'm going to mention in the next section of my talk, or there is a way to get compensation by suing in civil court. My response to this statement is, this is really, I think, the wrong question to ask. And I say this in particular to help um, um, police officers and detectives in terms of their practice. I, I put on the slide some questions that I think are better questions to ask. So how can we respond to this unique situation of harm to an older person? Has a crime occurred? What does the older person want or need? How can the justice system help this person? Is there an urgent safety issue? And what can we do to increase safety? Does this older person understand what is happening? So do they have capacity to make their own decisions about what to do? Is there a need for urgent medical care? So none of these questions are going to dictate a clear path, but I think they help us figure out what to do. And that is one of the challenges of elder abuse work. Even once you know the law, you still have to be kind of curious, patient, and supportive of older people in crisis and try to problem solve what is the best way to move forward. S some circumstances might indicate elder abuse. Some might intimate. Some circumstances might indicate intimate partner violence. It might be a situation where there is an older person with a mental illness who needs some support or care. And none of these situations are kind of separate. They're kind of like overlapping circles. And the challenge to us is always to figure out what is the best way to move forward that is welcome to the older person with a best understanding of the law.
So what I want to move on now is to talk a little bit about provincial and territorial laws that are relevant to elder abuse and neglect response. Elder abuse laws across colonial Canada, they're really, in a way, elder abuse law is a kind of misnomer. There's no such thing as an elder abuse law, but there's a real mishmash of laws across the country that are relevant to elder abuse response. Each province and territory has taken a unique response to developing laws, creating public agencies, and funding nonprofit agencies to provide support to seniors who have experienced abuse and neglect. And all of this really reflects a policy choice. Um, but no matter where you're working in Canada, it's really important to be conscious of what the laws are that apply in your jurisdiction, because the laws vary slightly and sometimes substantially from province to province. The kind of laws I'm going to cover in this next section of my talk are adult protection laws, family violence laws, and laws that apply specifically to long-term care. There are other unique laws that do apply to abuse and neglect response, and we cover them in the practical guide. Uh, I just don't want to provide that much detail in this presentation, but to give you some examples of what you'll find there, some jurisdictions that provincial uh, public guardian trustee has some powers to respond. In Quebec, the Human Rights Commission has jurisdiction to respond to exploitation of older adults. And Manitoba has unique legislation for responding to abuse and neglect of adults who are living with a mental disability from adulthood. So there are some specific laws that are, exist only in specific jurisdictions. I'm just not going to cover them today but we cover them in detail in our practical guide. So adult protection laws. These laws apply broadly to adults who are vulnerable, not just to abuse and neglect of seniors and not exclusively to seniors. What they do is they designate agencies to respond to reports of abuse, neglect, or self-neglect of older people. They define key terms for the legal framework, they indicate what kinds of abuse are covered by that piece of legislation. They're not the same in every province and territory. And they create some powers to respond to abuse and neglect. So this slide lists the provinces and territories that have adult protection legislation. Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland have adult protection legislation that applies exclusively to um, protecting vulnerable adults. Quebec has some more recent legislation that is their elder abuse response legislation. It um, applies to what they call maltreatment of seniors, and it has some specific provisions related to responding to abuse of adults living in residential long-term care. BC's Adult Guardianship Act Part 3 deals with adult protection, and then Yukon has a part four for adult protection that's part of its protection and decision-making legislation. Each of these statutes or sections of a statute provides fairly broad powers for responding to abuse and neglect of vulnerable adults. This slide highlights some of the powers you find in BC's Adult Guardianship Act. So the powers to conduct investigations if there's been a report, get access to private information, so overrides privacy legislation, power to enter premises and examine the adult with a court order, make a report to police or PGT, that report in BC is required if there's been a criminal act, potentially get a no contact order, so to separate the vulnerable adult from people who are abusing them, power to get a support and assistance plan to address some of the needs of the adult and potentially impose that support and assistance plan without their consent by virtue of a court order. And then there are also some powers to intervene in an emergency. So again, these are the powers you find in BC's legislation. Each of the um, statutes I described on the previous slide has slightly different powers. But this is just to give you a sample of the kind of powers you find in BC's laws. So 
Although these are statutes that have been created to respond to abuse and neglect of vulnerable adults, or in the case of Quebec seniors, they don't all provide for mandatory reporting, which is an expression we often hear in the context of abuse and neglect. So in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, their legislation contains a public duty to report elder abuse and neglect or more, more generally abuse and neglect of a vulnerable adult. In the legislation of Prince Edward Island and Quebec, there is mandatory reporting for certain individuals. So in Prince Edward Island, it's people whose occupation um, grants them a duty of care or responsibility for vulnerable adults. So social workers, healthcare professionals, for example. In Quebec, the situations that require mandatory reporting include people living in residential long-term care or staff working in those settings. In BC, Yukon, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, there is no general duty to report abuse and neglect. But what the legal framework provides instead is that if a, a report is made, there is a mandatory sort of responsibility of the province to respond to abuse and neglect. So that's why I say it's sort of mandatory response instead of mandatory reporting. And generally, the institution required to respond will be some part of the provincial government or a uh, health authority. You kind of, you do need to look at each like specific statute to find out who has mandatory responsibility to report in that jurisdiction. Got to look at the legislation, or you can also find that information in our practical guide to elder abuse and neglect law in Canada. So the second kind of provincial legislation that I want to talk about today is family violence legislation. And the reason why I want to spend some time covering this legislation is that I find that most legal resources on elder abuse and neglect response tend to focus exclusively on this first section I just covered. So adult protection and adult guardianship legislation. But actually family violence legislation can provide a useful part of the law if we're concerned about a adult who's being abused or neglected. And one of the things that's important about this kind of legislation is it allows the person who's being harmed to seek assistance from the court. Whereas in abuse and neglect legislation under adult protection, it's usually someone else trying to get help for them. So family violence legislation gives more agency to the person who has experienced abuse and neglect. And although it was developed more to assist a children and women facing intimate partner violence, you know, we know that many people who are experiencing violence as older adults are actually women living in violent situations where you know, spousal violence is kind of grown old and shifted. So family violence legislation is an important part of our elder abuse response legal toolkit. So family violence legislation defines family violence. So what kinds of abuse could be covered? It defines family member, which means lets you know which in kinds of individuals, members of the family could get help through this legislation. In some jurisdictions, it's more limited than others. In some jurisdictions, it's very clear that grandparents can apply whether or not they live with the um, person who's harming them. In other jurisdictions, it, it's more limited specifically to couples. This legislation tends to apply whether the family violence has already happened or if there's a risk. And its general purpose is to allow courts to intervene to make an order with the goal of protecting the person who has experienced violence or who might experience violence. And the laws tell us, tell the courts who can apply for an order. So this slide lists all the family violence legislation that exists in Canada. So I think there are 10 jurisdictions listed on the slide. The laws are slightly differently uh, titled, but you get the gist of it. There's usually family violence, domestic violence, or intimate partner violence in the title of the statute. And none of it a little more uniquely titles the statute Family Abuse Intervention Act. 
you can find information on each of these statutes in our practical guide. So I'm not going to read off all of these complex titles for you today. But I wanted to highlight that these are jurisdictions, these 10 that have shorter statutes dealing exclusively with family violence legislation. On this next slide, these are the three other jurisdictions in Canada. So BC, Ontario, and Quebec have family violence provisions, but they form part of larger statutes. So in BC and Ontario, you find the family violence provisions that give the power of the court to create protection orders in family law legislation. And in Quebec, it's part of the civil code. So just to give you an example for one jurisdiction in Canada, the Northwest Territories, their legislation says that you can apply for an order if you've lived together in an intimate or family relationship with the person who is harming you, you have a child with the person who's abusing you, or you're the abuser's spouse or former spouse, or you're the parent or grandparent and you're experiencing intimate partner violence or family violence. So you can see the legislation makes it very clear that older people in a grandparenting relationship or parenting relationship could benefit from this legislation. Their definition of family violence is very long and complex, and I'm not going to walk you through it, but I just want to highlight some aspects of it to show you just how broad the definition of family violence is, and then it can include most kinds of elder abuse. So it highlights damage to property, situations where the applicant has experienced fear for their safety, whether or not family violence has happened. It includes specifically sexual abuse, forcible confinement, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, or physical abuse. So that's quite a comprehensive definition of family violence, at least as comprehensive as um, what you find in adult protection legislation in Canada. So just to give you a sense of the kind of terms that could form part of a protection order created by a judge, you can see no contact or no communication with the person who is being harmed, stay away from certain locations, such as the place where they are living, exclusive occupation of the home, provisions on not being allowed to have a firearm or other weapon, Provisions allowing the police to remove the person from a scene, you know, the abusive person. Provisions allowing the police or directing the police to accompany a person experiencing abuse to remove their belongings and move out. A requirement to get counseling or really most legislation has a catch-all that says the judge can create any provisions that they consider necessary to help the, um, address the safety situation. So how can you get an order? Um, family violence provisions, they require someone to go to court to get an order. Uh, it could be the person experiencing abuse and neglect, but most legislation allows someone else who's concerned about the older person to apply for an order on their behalf, generally with their consent. Because it requires getting an order from a court, there is often a possibility of getting provincial legal aid to fund legal assistance to get that order. Criminal charges are not necessary. Just to, this slide here is really to remind you that protection orders are available through criminal court or through civil court. And um, we've produced a resource called Roads to Safety. On page 66, we provide a comparison of criminal and civil orders for BC. Um, the, a piece, the criminal order is called either a peace bond or a section 810 recognizance. You might have heard that term before. Generally, if an older person's partner or the person abusing them is arrested and they're released into the community, um, it, it's common for the lawyer prosecuting the case or the police to get a peace bond put in place. So criminal uh, protection orders, the advantage really there is that you don't have to go to court. The, the state takes care of getting the order. But if no criminal system has been involved, 
you can still get a protection order by going to civil court through family violence legislation. Um, but there are just in most jurisdictions in Canada, there are civil and criminal routes to get protection orders if an older person has been harmed or fears for their safety. So now I'm going to switch gears and briefly mention a third kind of provincial legislation that's relevant to abuse and neglect response. So most jurisdictions have some kind of legal requirement to respond to abuse of adults who are living in a long-term care setting. There are two kinds of legislation that applies in situations like this. Some jurisdictions have specific legislation called kind of protections for persons in care. And some jurisdictions have a requirement to respond to abuse of older people living in a congregate housing setting. As, so those requirements will form part of a larger statute. And I'm just going to highlight those statutes for you right now so you can look at the legislation in your own time. So four jurisdictions in Canada have protection for persons in care legislation. That's Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia. And this legislation is really easy to recognize. They all have the same title, Protection for Persons in Care Act. In some other jurisdictions, you find a requirement to respond to abuse of happening in a long-term care or congregate housing setting sandwiched within a much larger statute. So in BC, we have the Community Care and Assisted Living Act. Ontario has a requirement to respond to abuse in congregate housing settings in the Long-Term Care Homes Act and the Retirement Homes Act. So again, these laws apply specifically to long-term care or congregate housing settings, but you'll recall the slides earlier, I was talking about adult protection legislation. So adult protection legislation also applies in long-term care settings. So um, you can still respond to abuse through a statutory framework in a, when it's happening in long-term care context outside of these six jurisdictions I'm mentioning in this section, but you would do so through their adult protection legislation or in Quebec through their maltreatment legislation. So this legislation that applies specifically to long-term care exists because we recognize that um, people living in long-term care settings are generally vulnerable adults. They may be frail or they may have capacity issues where they don't understand what is happening and are limited in their ability to protect themselves. And that is why these kinds of legislation always feature a mandatory reporting. So if you, technically, if you learn that someone is being abused in long-term care, you do have a requirement to report that abuse to the agency listed in that piece of legislation. Some of these kinds of legislation actually allow the state to find people who don't re uh, report abuse. I have not seen cases where it is discussed that people are actually fined for failing to report abuse, but um, this legislation often includes a kind of uh, fining provision. In this fourth section, I'd like to talk about our guiding principles for best practices that are contained in the practical guide. I'm gonna go into a few of them in more detail, but on this slide, I just want to um, highlight what the 12 guiding principles are. So we encourage you to listen to the older person and make that your first and kind of most foundational approach to your work. Respect their personal values and choices. Respect and support decision-making autonomy. Make sure you're always getting consent or permission to take action, except in those rare instances where the adult does not have capacity to protect themselves. Respect confidentiality and privacy rights and only act outside of of those um, rights when there's clear permission and direction under legal frameworks. Avoid ageist and ableist thinking. So a lot of that is linked to thinking an older person can't make choices about what they want to do when they can live at risk. Recognize the value of independence and autonomy for most people who are experiencing abuse and neglect. Learn about and apply trauma-informed practice when you're doing your elder abuse response work. 
apply a holistic lens. And what I mean by this is think about that whole person. They may not just need to live free of abuse. They may need safe housing, medical care. Try, try and think about that whole person. Respect cultural values and be aware of when cultural factors can enhance safety for that older person. Respect relationships that matter and consider some of the unique challenges and safety issues that um, Indigenous people may live with, including um, distrust of and the racism they experience in institutions that are supposed to be protecting them. So now I'm just going to go through four of these um, guiding principles that um, to me are some of the most important ones. So first of all, listen to that older person. It is really important that your response to elder abuse is always grounded in the older person's understanding of a situation or their relationships and not other pe people's views. Unless that older person has a, a disability or illness that results in an inability to understand their situation and appreciate the risk that they're facing. Most people are really able to make decisions for themselves, including about risk and getting help. Even when they are older, they just may need some help to understand what the options are. Part of that experience is building rapport and trust with that older person and supporting them to get help is often not an overnight situation. You're building a relationship so that they trust you enough to help them to access the support that they need and figure out what might be the most welcome kind of support, given their cultural values and what kinds of institutions are safe to them. Second, respect and support decision-making autonomy. So all adults with decision-making capacity have a right to make their own decisions, regardless of age or disability, including decisions that we might consider unwise or unrisky. So what this means is we need to be careful that we're not acting to override the autonomy of competent adults. If the, you have a reason to think that the person does not have capacity to make their own decisions, then that could impact how you support them and might indicate a response through adult protection legislation that I highlighted earlier. But in most cases, adults are able to make choices to um, access help and assistance that they welcome. The adult protection frameworks that I described earlier, remember they don't apply to all situations of elder abuse. They apply to situations where adults are vulnerable and able and not able to protect themselves. And that could include older people, but also the younger adults who aren't able to protect themselves. You also want to make sure your practices support and not undermine capacity and that you're doing whatever you can to support capacity. So some adults who are experiencing abuse and neglect may seem like they don't understand what's going on or seem confused, but sometimes that can be a function of trauma and untreated medical conditions. So you wanna see what you can do as a helper to support their capacity. Sometimes that might be helping them to access counseling to uh, support their trauma response and coping. Sometimes that might be helping them to get medical care to treat untreated conditions. And sometimes that could mean changing the supportive environment so that they can make their own decisions. So helping them to access support from people they trust, helping them to feel safer, slowing down, doing whatever you can to change the way you do your work so that you're supporting rather than undermining the capacity of a person to make their own choices and understand what is going on. Fourth, seek consent or permission. There are rare instances where you might not be seeking consent to act, such as where adult protection legislation applies and a person is vulnerable or being harmed and doesn't understand what is going on. But in most situations, an older person does understand what is going on, so you should be seeking permission to do anything, including making phone calls to get help for them. Every phone call is sharing their personal information, and they have rights to choose how their information is being shared. 
as part of that process, you want to check regularly to make sure the older person is comfortable with how events are unfolding. People have a right to change their mind. And sometimes, you know, as things unfold, uh, people need to check in and they may decide that they're not comfortable with the police being involved anymore. Then they get to change their mind. Or maybe they need to um, talk about what kinds of institutions they're comfortable working with. And maybe they don't want to go to the hospital because the hospital feels like a dangerous racist place for them. So you want to check to make sure that the adult doesn't feel like um, they've signed on and got on a train that's kind of left the station and is going on without their control. They, they should have a right to, to control how events unfold with your support rather than you controlling the situation. And finally, respect relationships that matter. So you want to be aware of the relationships that are important to the older person and support the preservation of these relationships while offering safety planning strategies if appropriate. Sometimes people who are being harmed care deeply about the people that are harming them and you cannot force them to leave those relationships if they understand what is going on, but you can support them to be as safe as possible in the context of those relationships, helping them to access the right kinds of assistance. You can also help them get support for the people they love who are harming them. Often older adults are being harmed by um, younger adults in their families who have untreated mental health conditions or substance use issues. And one of the ways you help the older person can be to help them help that younger person get support and assistance. Often older people are more willing to get help for themselves once they know the people they love are getting the care they need. And they will protect the people who harm them at all costs themselves. So it can be challenging to help an older person who's experiencing abuse and neglect unless you really understand those relationships that matter to them, acknowledge the importance of them, and address the needs of those challenging individuals. You may strongly dislike them because you see them as an abuser, but completely ignoring them is probably going to undermine your ability to help that older person. So now just to wrap up some final thoughts on elder abuse and neglect response. So a common term you may hear is complex needs. So responding to abuse and neglect of older adults is complicated stuff. It's important that you understand the law, but it's also important that you consider their complex needs and all the different systems in their community that could be helpful. Complex needs can be kind of off-putting and um, make us reluctant to respond. But if we're aware of all the other different parts of the support network, many of which have been highlighted by other parts of this roadmap series, you can feel more capable of providing assistance to an older adult who has experienced abuse and neglect. It really takes a village. You know, we talk about it takes a village to support a child and raise a family. It also takes a village to support older people who are experiencing harm. And this slide highlights some of the systems that can be part of it. Some are institutional, like healthcare institutions, and some are more informal, like family and friends. A person may need legal advice. A person might benefit from victim assistance or the support of a transition house. Or maybe they would benefit from an ongoing relationship with um, senior services that can keep an eye on them and provide ongoing support and assistance. Just to flag again, you hear this, the call often for mandatory reporting of abuse. And I would encourage you to think of reporting as just one of the ways of responding to abuse and neglect of older adults and not always the best way of responding because reporting takes power away from the older person who's being harmed and puts it in the hands of other institutions. You know what? People who have experienced abuse and neglect are in a power relationship where their power has been taken away. In most instances, supporting that person to get help 
should involve supporting them to have more power over their situation and not less. Sometimes reporting is critical, such as when an older person is living in long-term care and they clearly cannot access support and assistance on their own. And the place they're living has a fiduciary responsibility or some kind of legal responsibility to keep them safe. But in community, sometimes that older person can support themselves, access assistance, if we point them in the right direction and make assistance available to them. When you're responding, you always want to be thinking about, can this person um, make that decision for themselves about accessing support or are they a vulnerable adult? So just to, to review again, when you're thinking about the legal framework, and that's mostly what I've been talking about today, is the legal framework for responding to abuse and neglect in colonial Canada. You want to think about where is the abuse occurring? If the abuse is occurring in long-term care, a specific law might apply. If the abuse is occurring in that person's home, you might be wanting to think about broader legislation. Importantly, does that older person have the capacity to take action on their own and understand what is happening? If they are not able to understand their situation and they are experiencing abuse and neglect, living in the community, and maybe they don't have what we call capacity, so the ability to understand information and apply it to their situation and make choices, maybe they are a vulnerable adult. And so you might want to be responding using the abuse and the, the adult protection framework in your jurisdiction. Um, if they are able to understand their situation, you're not going to be reporting to a third party. You're going to be kind of walking with that older person and supporting them to access legal and policy options available in their community. So what is the degree of urgency is always an important question to think about. You know, if you see a crime unfolding and an older person is about to be harmed, then you may want to call the police and get help for them. But if it's not an emergent situation and it's an ongoing situation of mistreatment, again, you may want to be wanting to have a conversation with them to problem solve, you know, what kinds of help are most welcome to them. But you always want to be thinking about what matters most to this older person when you're thinking about what is the right, the right response. You kind of want them to steer the ship as much as possible rather than taking power away from them because abusive relationships take people's power away. So um, thank you so much for sticking around for this presentation and learning about the law. We. We do at our organization try to, on an ongoing basis, try to provide you with information about elder abuse and neglect response legislation and policy in Colonial Canada. If you want to keep in touch, you can go to our website and register for our mailing list. You can look at our website where we post information on all of our materials so you can access them for free. We publish information on elder law issues and abuse and neglect response through our social media channels, especially on Twitter. So please keep in touch. We will next month be publishing our practical guide to elder abuse and neglect law in Canada. And that's going to be a separate website. You'll be able to access it from this website, but we'll be publishing that URL on our website shortly. And the webinar to officially launch the Practical Guide to Elder Abuse and Neglect Law in Canada is going to be hosted by the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. We will be sharing more information on that webinar, as will CNPEA, shortly through social media. And I look forward to seeing you all at that event. So then on now, I'm just going to pass the baton back to Benedict. Thank you so much, Krista, and thank you all for attending. You can access all five sessions at the YouTube link below. For more information about Future Us and how you can get involved and how to get in touch with us, visit futureus.cnpa.ca.